welcome, please, Christopher Booker.
have known about and think constantly about. Something called the Climate Change Act. Now, it's not hugely mentioned in the media, but it really is one of the most extraordinary things that's ever happened in this country, that almost unanimously three years ago, our politicians in the House of Commons voted through an act which committed us by law for the next 40 years, every year, to spend £18 billion on reducing our emissions of evil CO2 by 80%. It's, even on the government's own figures, it's by far the most expensive law that has ever been passed by a British Parliament. But, of the 463 MPs who voted for it, who trooped sheep-like through the lobby in support of what Mr. Ed Miliband was proposing at the time, he actually did, for a brief moment, exercise a bit of power, Mr. Miliband. I don't think it's going to happen again. <laughs> Um, not one of those MPs could have begun to explain how it would have been possible, or how it would be possible, to reduce our emissions of CO2 by four-fifths without closing down virtually the whole of the British economy. That is the sort of surreal fact which, alas, we have become increasingly used to in recent years years. And in each of those, in the story of each of these great visions of our time, global warming, the dream of United Europe, we can see something of a similar pattern emerging. In the case of Europe, for a long time, the project seemed to be going pretty well. Treaty after treaty, more and more powers were handed over by the nation states to the centre of this new, strange form of government above us all. But as it got nearer to its ultimate goal, it began to run into a number of difficulties. And this became particularly apparent, of course, when they tried to foist on us that thing called the Constitution for Europe. It took them eight years to sweat away trying to draft this thing. They had to indulge in every kind of dishonesty and deceit, the treaty that dare not, the Constitution which dare not speak its name. And of course, as we know, uh, when it came to the crunch, we had three important countries all deciding in referendums that this project was something about which they didn't like any longer what the project was up to. But they got their constitution eventually by the White Crook, and almost immediately they then found themselves plunged into this horrible, <coughs> horrifying crisis which we are witnessing today over the other project part of the project which was designed to be a crowning glory. The Constitution was described as the crowning glory and of course the other great crowning glory is the Euro and we are seeing today what is happening to that one. Now, there's something of a similar pattern we can see in what's happened over global warming. Again, for a long time, it seemed as if everything was going the way of those who were warning us that we were facing this appalling catastrophe because of our dreadful emissions of CO2, and we had treaty after treaty, we had all sorts of laws being passed, we had the politicians falling in behind the science, and the science for a while looked quite plausible, because the science said that the CO2 goes up, and so temperatures will follow, and for about 15 or 20 years, that looked, as I say, quite plausible. But then, two or three years ago, a number of rather important questions began to be asked. For a start, we had the problem of the fact that although CO2 was continuing to go up, the global temperatures were not rising in anything like the way that all those computer models, uh, the IPC's computer models, had predicted. There was a disparity between the two. We had, um, of course, uh, we had a number of more and more eminent scientists across the world, particularly in the United States, questioning whether this theory that CO2 is the cause of global warming was actually based on proper science at all. They were suggesting that there were actually much more plausible reasons why the temperatures of the world have been going up for 200 years, not for the last 20 years, and that uh, the most important things of all were natural forces like shifts in ocean currents and uh, vari variations in solar radiation. 
So you've got, for the first time, really serious questioning of the science. And of course, we then had a curious event in Copenhagen two years ago, where there was going to be, where there was indeed the largest conference the world has ever seen. Not often observed that, but there were 100,000 people came to that conference. All the world leaders were there, Mr. Obama was there, everyone was there. And it was, of course, a complete fiasco. Not least because by this time it was quite clear that we were not going to get world agreement on a treaty which was going to present mankind with the largest bill in the history of the world. Not least because the fast developing nations led by China and India weren't going to have any of it. And so Copenhagen collapsed. At the same time, we got all those scandals surrounding the IPC, the holy IPCs, this bountiful wisdom. Is this me making this terrible noise? No? Uh, we had all those climate gates and all the other scandals which have really demolished the once holy reputation of the IPCC. In other words, we've seen the whole global warming thing in the last two years beginning to lose uh, credibility uh, lose momentum, uh, run out of steam. Uh, it has faced, as I say, a crisis, as indeed has the dream of a united Europe. In fact, what we can see in both these stories is something of a similar pattern emerging. And it's a pattern, in fact, we've long been familiar with, not just all the way through history, but we have seen, we can see it uh, reflected again and again in the world's story. <coughs> It's the pattern of what happens when people conscious, unconsciously get caught up, individually or collectively, in what amounts to some act of make-believe which defies the reality of the world around them. Their wishful thinking leads them into a course of action which is seemingly so compelling and so important that everything else pales into insignificance beside it. But what then follows, the fantasy, make-believe, the dream, falls into a pattern which I call the fantasy cycle, where for a while all seems to go well, the dream stage. Maybe quite a long time. But because ultimately it's based on a defiance of reality, this obsessive make-believe, things start to go wrong for it, what I call the frustration stage. And gradually reality begins to crowd in around the great dream it starts to hit back. And we see the dream turning into a nightmare stage where everything starts to go wrong and where people are helpless at the mercy of events around them. And this finally, the final stage is where a great collision with reality takes place where the whole thing falls apart and the destruction stage. Uh, it's what the Greeks used to say Hubris meets with nemesis, and that's what they were talking about. It's a pattern we see, as I say, all through history, all through literature. And I'm not sure that the Greeks of today, I'm not sure that Mr. Papandreou has actually realized that if he read the old Greek tragedies, he would know rather better what's going on to his country, his unhappy, sad country, uh, as it finds that it's, the nemesis has arrived. That the pattern of the euro, in fact, is the perfect example. It fits this pattern to a T. Because if you remember, for a long time, it seemed that the euro, the great project, this crowning glory, was working reasonably well. And of course, the poorer countries of Europe, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, they couldn't believe their luck. Low interest rates, they could borrow billions and billions of imaginary euros, they could spend them, they could build horrible concrete houses, they could do all sorts of amazing things. But eventually they began to realize that all this imaginary money that they'd been spending was beginning to open up a huge mountain, or rather a bottomless pit of debt. And so we've seen this drama unfolding over the last year or two where Gradually, the frustration stage has turned into a real nightmare stage where the whole of Europe is now looking aghast at what's going on. It is indeed a bottomless pit. Is there indeed any, all the money in Europe? Could it fill that bottomless pit? We are looking at something quite extraordinary, quite unprecedented in the history of mankind. 
and it is a disaster which has been brought by the European dream, by the European Union, entirely on itself, ignoring all the good advice they were given in the 70s and the 80s, how it's not going to work unless you have certain preconditions. But they were so hell-bent on this supreme symbol of uniting Europe under a political and economic government that they charged ahead, and Nemesis is now at last beginning to close in on them. We haven't got there yet. We are living in another little sort of dreamlike period now, where we can see that disaster is coming, but the real disasters, apart from, of course, what is happening to a lot of people in Greece and Portugal and Ireland, the real disasters, I'm afraid for all of us, are still just round the corner. And that is going to be the story of the history of the next year or two or three or five or ten. Now, the fading of these great dreams, fantasies of our time has, of course, left us, as that indicates, in one hell of a mess. The global warming scare may be at last running out of steam, despite the desperate efforts of its true believers to attempt to convince us that, to keep it in being. But we're still left with a political class, both here and in Brussels, which is firmly committed to the dream, or the vision, or the belief. We're still left with the Climate Change Act, committing us to a target which, if we could only get halfway to meeting it, would still be tantamount to Britain committing economic suicide. We are still left with Mr. Chris Hume. <laughs> he has one fan. The only one in England. <laughs> now, Mr. Hume, dreams, as you know, of spending hundreds of billions of pounds paying mainly to foreign companies to cover our countryside and our seas with thousands of windows. Totally useless windows. Very expensive, totally unreliable, completely pointless, utterly futile windows. And even if we decided that it wasn't very sensible to waste our money in this way, we would find, of course, that we are committed to building these silly things by our wholly unrealizable commitment to our masters in Brussels that within nine years we have to generate nearly a third of our electricity from renewable energy sources. It is just so stupidly mad, one <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't know where to begin. Currently, those stupid windmills produce just over 2%. And the thought that we could build 200,000 more, Mr. Hewn, would you like? It still wouldn't work, because of course the wind doesn't blow it off the time. <laughs> We'd have to build lots of proper power stations to make up for it. We're still stuck with the government's carbon floor escalator, which some of you, if you were in business, will probably know about. Some others of you may know about it, but, it but it hasn't really been much written about by or talked about by the media at large. But this, this, this is an effect of tax on emitting CO2, charge on industry, on our electricity bills, and so forth. And if you look at it, it's an escalator. It starts not too much higher. We pay £16, pounds. in two years' time, we're paying £16 pounds a tonne for every tonne of CO2 emitted. I mean, we don't think of CO2 being in tonnes, but they've got ways of working that out. And they've certainly got ways of putting uh, tax on it. But after that, it escalates. Eventually, it's going to go up to £17 pounds a tonne. And there is no way, if this is, stays on the statute book, that, within, that we can avoid, within, say, six, seven years, our electricity bills being doubled just by this tax, which will drive millions more people in this country into fuel poverty. Now, I've often said that Mr. Hume must rank as the minister, if you look at the whole of British history, I cannot think of a single minister who is less fitted for his job than Mr. Hume. <laughs> Even if we, or, or probably the Essex police, managed to get rid of Mr. Hume, <laughs> who can 
guarantee that his successor would not be almost as stupid and useless as he is. Because it would still have to come from the not the Conservative Party led by Mr. Cameron, the Lib Dems like Mr. Hume, or Mr. Ed Miliband's Labour Party, all of whom are equally all obsessed with the same utter mad lunatic dream. So, we have, that's the situation we're faced with on, and I, sooner or later there's going to have to be a crunch on this, because the whole of our energy policy is so mad, so self-destructive, so completely detached from reality, so lost in the fantasy world, that unless there is a real showdown and a real explosion of common sense and blows it away, and it's hard to see at the moment where it's going to come from. We really are faced with the most massive trouble in this country. But, again, it's something which we are going to have to watch over the next five or ten years. Are we actually going to return to sanity, or are we going to go even further into this suicidal dream of nightmare world? As for the Euro, of course, uh, what we're looking at uh, is something that was originally planned to weld all the peoples of Europe happily together under this form of government. Are the peoples of Europe happy today? Are the Greeks happy? Are the Portuguese happy? Are the Irish happy? In Germany, they're getting more and more angry at having to pour good money after bad into the bottomless pit. In Brussels, as Gerard said, they rush around like headless chickens and all they can say is, what we need is more Europe. <laughs> the truth is that none of them have the slightest idea what to do about the mess that they've got into, that they have brought upon themselves. It's all very well for Mr. Obama, who more and more looks like a sort of cardboard cutout from a tailor's window. What is, what is he? He's a two-dimensional thing. I mean, he looked terrific when he was elected, but by golly, there's nothing there. But actually, that's unfair on Obama, because it implies that I mean, there's no one. The Chinese and the Indians must be absolutely staggered by what's going on. And of course, they're involved. We're all involved. This mess that we've all got into, they've got us into, is one that the whole world is looking at with dread and horror. And of course very much including ourselves here in Britain, because not only might we have to spend billions and billions more that we haven't got through the IMF, and heaven knows what we are eventually going to have to pay for this ghastly, catastrophic political blunder. But we must always remember in this country that we are still, our public spending is still rising despite those cuts. We are still borrowing three billion pounds a week, adding to the national debt. And we are having to borrow a lot of that money now to make provision, not only for international aid, which of course is wonderful, we're all so keen on what's being done with our money in international aid, but we're also having to spend and borrow a lot of money in order to lend it, we borrow it, we lend it to the Greeks or whoever, they can't pay it back. So we have to borrow more money to pay the interest on the money we pay. Ah, come on, this is absolutely crazy. But all this brings me to what the future of the European Union has got a massive great question mark over it, but what about us here in Britain? What should be our relationship with it? which Gerard has already dressed in his own way. Undoubtedly, in terms of public opinion and the mood of many of our Tory MPs, and I think some of them probably are actually still Tories, the plates have undoubtedly been shifting. There, was, uh, there are a great many more people today than there would have been even a year or two back who would have agreed with one of my favourite comments on this subject from a book called Statecraft by Mrs. Thatcher. Lady Thatcher. She wrote, and I'm sure quite a lot of you know this quote, because it, it is one. It's just such a wonderful summing up of the situation. That such an unnecessary and irrational project as building a European superstate was ever embarked on, she writes, will seem in future years to be perhaps the greatest folly of the modern era. And that Britain with her traditional strengths and global destiny, should ever have become part of it, 
will appear an error of the first magnitude. Now, those are fine words which we can all rightly applaud, but we have to be realistic about where we are today. When, yet again, a huge majority of MPs the other day denied us the chance of a referendum on Europe, how many more times do we have to be denied it? We were told that if it had been allowed, it might have given us three options. One was that we get out of the EU, one was that we stay in on present terms, and the third was that we go for a compromise which would allow us to agree a new relationship based on renegotiation and repatriation of powers. Now the problem with this third way, although it is the one favoured by many of these so-called uh, Tory Eurosceptic MPs, and indeed is actually one which might possibly win that referendum that they're not going to be allowed to have, is, and most people in this room will know this, is that it is holding out the prospect of something which simply isn't on offer. We can dream dreams till the cows come home of repatriating employment law or reclaiming control of our fisheries, uh, of our fishing waters, or opting out of the European arrest warrant. But anyone who talks in those terms hasn't grasped the most basic principle on which the whole of this project has rested since it was founded, which is the acquis communautaire, the great principle that once powers have been handed over by nation states to the centre, they cannot be handed back. I recall years ago John Redwood on a platform was uh, holding forth about how we must go to Brussels and ask for lots of powers to be repatriated. And he got a terrific hand from an audience not totally dissimilar to this one. And uh, he got some very sympathetic questions. Yes, I think this is steering the right direction. But finally a guy stood up at the back of the hall and he said, uh, Mr. Edward, if we go to Brussels and we make these demands and they say no, what would we do then? And Redwood looked, there was an awkward moment where he was trying to think what to say, and he came up with, uh, well, then we would just have a very interesting conversation. <laughs> As for staying where we are, staying in, that would probably not, at the moment, be overwhelmingly popular with the majority of the British people. But, I have to say, it, was, it is equally doubtful, even now, whether we would actually get an overwhelming majority prepared to vote for us to get out, despite what the polls say. And I suggest that that is for an understandable reason. We would be asking them to step into the unknown without having prepared the way by holding out to them a properly worked out and positive alternative. Now, Gerard's had a go at that in his own way. I, probably differ with him in certain respects on this because the facts are that however unpopular the EU may have become here in Britain, and certainly it is more unpopular than it's ever been before, most people, including most of our politicians, have only a very hazy idea of what it, how it actually works, let alone any real grasp of just how deeply enmeshed with it has become the whole of our own system of government in this country from top to bottom. Even if we were able to wave a magic wand and get out tomorrow, we would still find, as Gerard has said, we would still find that a huge quantity of our laws had originated from Brussels, which could not simply be repealed overnight. But it's worse than that, because most people have little idea of just how 40 years being part of this European project have rotted away the ability of our politicians and our civil servants to think for themselves. We have not only lost the power to govern ourselves, we have lost much of our old ability to govern ourselves. If we here in Britain are seriously to consider the Euro life after the European Union, we have to start thinking now about just what that would mean in practice and how we can offer the people of Britain a positive and practical vision of how we might once again learn what it is to be a self-respecting, independent country. And it is a hell of a mountain to climb. 
It is no good parking our discussions just on the wishful thinking that we can go to Brussels and ask, please can we have some of our powers back? If we really want to get out of this prison, this doomed make-believe form of government, which is going nowhere, in a world where so much of the future belongs to China and India and Brazil, and other countries which are growing fast. We've got to stop indulging in our own little dreams and start seriously thinking how, thinking now as to how our country might once again rebuild itself from the dreadful legacy Mr. Heath bequeathed to us 38 years ago. As it was described by the last true leader this country had, in whose honor this Bruges group was set up, that was indeed an era of the first magnitude. I'm sure everyone in this room agrees with that point. But if we are to undo that error, we have an enormous amount of work still to do. We have some very serious work to do. And our best hope, and I think we couldn't have said this with such confidence two years ago, possibly one year ago, is that the whole of this mad, make-believe, fantasy project, the European Union, into which we were sucked 38 years ago, is now, for the first time, or more than, certainly far more than ever before, thanks to the collapsing of its prize project, it's beginning to look no longer like the future, but very much like a discredited past. And I suspect that over the next five years, a lot of the questions, wishes, and dreams that we have about Britain's place in this ghastly system will, in fact, be very much influenced by the beginnings of the disintegration of something which, if it isn't going forward, can only, as they used to tell us, if the bicycle doesn't keep moving forward, it falls over. Well, I tell you this, the bicycle has fallen over. And we are all, in the end, going to look back and say that was the moment when Britain began to emerge from a gathering nightmare.